Hello and welcome to Sean White's Solar Energy Store Podcast. And today we have the chief cook, bottle washer, chairman of the board, and the founder of Fermata Energy, which is a music term, but I kind of like Fermata because it sounds sort of like Ferris because everybody's using these lithium iron phosphate batteries, LFP, and the F is for Ferris. So we'll have to give you a double meaning there, David. So let's have David introduce himself and say a bunch of great things about himself. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet your audience, David Slutsky, as Sean mentioned, the founder and currently chairman of the board for Fermata Energy. And what we do as a company is we make vehicle to grid happen. That's our lane. And we're very much excited about where this industry is heading, what it brings to the planet. And it's been a lot of fun kind of building this company up. Awesome. Yeah. And it looks like you've done a lot of things. So you're a little bit modest about yourself. I see that you worked for Clinton. You were doing something in the White House? I'm kind of an odd background as an entrepreneur. I have experience as an academic and experience as an entrepreneur and also experience in politics. I was a local elected official in the Charlottesville area, served four years on our board of supervisors. I also was a senior policy advisor during the Clinton administration, first at the EPA and then later at the White House. And then I've done a bit of academics. I've taught at the University of Virginia until last spring for about 23 years. First, I taught in the Commerce School, then I taught for 11 years in the Architecture School in Urban Environmental Planning, and then I spent much of the last 13 years in the Engineering School. There was some overlap there, and I'm literally the only trained philosopher on any of those faculties, so I'm a little bit of an odd academic. And then finally, I've been an entrepreneur through most of my adult life, I've started a couple of companies in the past, but Fermata Energy has been my project for the last little over a decade, and it's probably going to be my last significant entrepreneurial endeavor because I'm an old man now, 68 years old. <laughs> oh, that's nothing <clears throat> these days. That's kind of interesting. Also, I ran for county supervisor a couple of times. Probably, fortunately, I didn't win. I don't believe in money in politics, so I tried to do it without money. And I also ran for Congress one time, too, a very conservative district in California. And so obviously I'm not hanging out in Washington right now or the Board of Supervisors. So I wasn't as successful at getting elected as you are so far. I was a little bit more lucky than successful. I was literally the first Democrat on the ballot since the 80s when I ran in 2005. But I ran a pretty good race and I did win. And I got to serve four years till I figured out that I actually was a leftist. So kind of barely, but was defeated four years in. But it was a great four-year experience. I'll say that. Yeah, the politics out there is kind of interesting. I did a class over there. It wasn't too far from Charlottesville. In fact, I remember driving into Charlottesville to go to the bank. And I was staying in a place that you probably know about called Yogaville. Do you know Yogaville? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, down in Buckingham County. It's the Buckingham. Ashram, yes. Yeah, Buckingham County. That's right. Yeah. And so I did a class at a black church. And then they had me stay at Yogaville because it was the only place to stay. And plus all the yogis and the people at the black church were getting together to try to stop this Dominion pipeline. And so it was pretty exciting. It was kind of fun staying there. I was a vegetarian for a week and I woke up and did yoga every morning. So you got (laughs) younger in that week, I'll bet. I did. Yeah, I'm probably older than you and now I'm younger than you. So, (laughs) so yeah, that was kind of neat. That was just neat hiking around there and all that nice area and everything. And so I thought maybe what we could do too is just start educating people about things that you know a lot about. And so there's all these things, They most of them start with V2. And so V is for vehicle. The number two is just for actually TO, for vehicle to grid and vehicle to home. And so I was looking across your website and stuff too. And I noticed that you like using V2X. And then there was another one that I haven't heard of before. I don't know if it was something that you or your company made up, V1G. And I totally understand it, it's just one way. It's not just charging. But there are a lot of folks that do what we call V1G, which is smart charging. It's where you don't charge at the wrong time. So by not charging at a time when the grid's under stress, presumably that's contributing value and benefit to the grid. And so that's what the idea of V1G is, and is about being careful that you don't charge at the worst possible time. But that's not the same thing as V2G, where you actually discharge the vehicle battery in the direction of the grid and provide electrons to different purposes. So that's where the distinction comes in. It's for us, it's to the grid, as you say, that's what we're doing as a company is primarily V2G. 
we inherently do V1G because we aren't charging at the wrong time, but we're doing way more than that. Okay, great. Yeah. So one thing I would probably even call V1G would be something like demand response, load management, that kinds of things. And so it is kind of interesting. So I also kind of look at what you're doing is just, it's an energy storage system. And most of the batteries in this world right now are in the cars anyway. And so with an energy storage system, you can not only charge, but you could discharge. So, you know, just say that you have 10 kilowatts that you can deal with. You could go from 10 kilowatts charging to 10 kilowatts discharging, and you're doing a 20 kilowatt change. And so, of course, kilowatts are power. They're not energy. It's not how many batteries you have. It's sort of like how fast you can charge or discharge. And so we call that power. And then what was V2B? Again, the nomenclature is imprecise. Different people have different meanings. V2B is typically vehicle to building. Sometimes it's called vehicle to load. Sometimes it's V to C if you're talking about commercial buildings, but all of the alphabet soup that comprises what we in our company call V to X is basically about discharging a parked electric vehicle and sending electrons in the direction of the grid. And it can be behind the meter at the property where the car is parked and the charger exists. So you could be managing the electric load of that building, the building's appetite for electrons, so that by discharging into the building load, for example, when electrons are really expensive, you'll save money because instead of pulling those extra electrons from the utility through your meter, you're doing it from your car behind that meter. And so there are exercises like that that you can do with an electric vehicle to save money on your electric bill in a commercial application. You can also discharge electrons that go into the building but it also counts towards the utility's load. Might be that you backfeed beyond the building's load into the utility. Typically, if you're behind a load, you don't actually backfeed, but you're still offsetting the load that the utility has to provide to the building. And when the utility system is under pressure, under strain, you know, it's a hot summer afternoon and it's late in the day and solar is starting to ramp down and people are coming home and turning things on the system-wide load can get very high and the utility has to get those electrons from somewhere and they're very expensive at those times when the system's under duress. So if you can figure out a commercial arrangement with the utility, that's what vehicle to grid is all about, the utility can compensate you for discharging in the direction of the grid at those critical times, reducing the utility's load, saving them from having to buy those electrons at a very high price somewhere else. And so that's another form of V to X activity where you're basically saving the utility money. And there are other things you can do for the utilities beyond just managing their load for them. You can play with something called a VAR and you can play with their power quality. There's all sorts of pain points that utilities experience in their efforts to bring us electricity. And a lot of times a bi-directional electric vehicle can support some of those efforts and be compensated for it from the utility. And then finally, above the utility level, there's the grid itself. And there are different grid level operators. In California, it's known as KISO. In the mid-Atlantic, it's the PJM runs the grid. When you said KISO, that's California Independent System Operator. Thank you. That's exactly right. And there's a series of these independent operators. We call them the grid. And they each have their own markets because they have their own level of function that they provide to the system, if you will. It's a very complicated system, the US power grid. And there are markets that you can participate in electric vehicle in at the grid level. So it's vehicle to home, vehicle to building, vehicle to the utility in different ways, vehicle to the grid. All of that stuff is what we basically call V to X. Yeah, I remember first came out with the Lightning Ford F-150. And they were saying how you could hook it up to your home and everybody thought, oh, that's really exciting. And I couldn't figure out at first if that just meant you could only back up your home. But then I saw that Duke Energy was had some kind of a program where they could help, you know, export to the grid and help the grid out, maybe hook it up to a virtual power plant, a VPP and things like that. Do you know if they're doing that yet? That particular project that Duke has is really a demonstration project of the ability of the F-150 to do that. We did have a press release a couple of years ago from Ford that they were working with Fermata Energy to do V to X with the F-150 Lightning. 
But without getting into things that are covered by my non-disclosure agreement, Ford is definitely aware of the value of discharging their vehicle, and they're working on a number of strategies to make that possible. But their initial focus has definitely been providing backup power to the home, which is not really focused on the grid itself. Eventually, all of these vehicle OEMs are going to be partners in this ecosystem of grid stabilization that comes with V2X. Well, all of our listeners have promised not to say anything, so you can tell us all the things that are on the non-disclosure agreement, right? <laughs> yeah, I can speak generically about what's going on in the industry, and a lot of it will apply to each of the OEMs because it's kind of the uh -huh. same thing across the yeah. platform. Yeah. Uh -huh. Great. Yeah, and then I noticed that Nissan, being in, from Japan, and they had Fukushima and all that, and I think they were kind of the first company to go big time on vehicle to grid. Do you know more about that than I do? <laughs> it's possible. It's interesting you mentioned both Nissan, but also the relationship of V2X to the Fukushima disaster, because it's actually V2X was born out of the fiasco of, of Fukushima. TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric yeah. Power Company, it's the largest utility in Japan. And I should, for full disclosure, they're also an investor in Fermata. A number of oh, utilities wow. are. Maybe I better be an investor too. Yeah, investors are always welcome with startups. <laughs> Nobody will ever uh -huh. turn that down. But TEPCO invested in us because when they had Fukushima happen, the power grid in Japan was heavily dependent on nuclear power. And suddenly they were constrained in their access to generation from nuclear power plants. So they had a scramble to manage their load. So they got into a partnership with Nissan, and I believe Mitsubishi was part of this effort too. And they developed a bi-directional feature to the Chatamo protocol, which is a protocol that governs the connection between a charger and an electric vehicle. Great. And I they wanted developed... to talk about those topics too, but we can hit that in a minute. All the different it's an important topic because there's a lot of confusion yeah. and a lot of failure of regulation in this country that's impeding the development of v acts associated with that. But TEPCO, jointly with Nissan, developed a vehicle-to-home program, which they deployed using Nissan Leafs. And because Nissan was way out in front of the rest of the OEMs on electric vehicles, and so they ended up making the Leaf in North America and in Europe bidirectional starting in 2013. And so that vehicle has been capable of doing V2X for longer than the technology has been actually active. So early yeah, days, we forged a partnership with Nissan because we needed a bidirectional vehicle. And by golly, they had one and it worked well. That's interesting because I'm just wondering why I have never seen anybody with a bidirectional Nissan Leaf. I've seen plenty of Nissan Leafs. I've got friends in the renewable energy industry. Not They're all something. bidirectional. If it was made in 2013 or later in the North American market, it's mm -hmm. bidirectional. The problem is, okay, it's bidirectional. Now what do I do? Well, mm -hmm. there weren't any bidirectional chargers, and that's been one of the challenges. Small problem. And so let's step back. So what do you need to do V to X? Let's start with that. You need three things. You need a bidirectionally enabled vehicle. Nissan checked that box for us with the Leaf. But now, as you mentioned, the Ford F-150, and frankly, most Major OEMs are going in the direction of bidirectionality as fast as they can because they now see that you can make thousands of dollars per year with a parked EV. So they all want to be part of that party. But so you need a bidirectional vehicle, and that box has been checked off first by Nissan and now by everybody. The second thing you need is a bidirectional charger. And for various reasons, for certainly for the near future, it needs to be an offboard DC charger, but that's a whole nother technical conversation. But you need a bidirectional charger to connect that bidirectional vehicle to the different grid facing revenue generating opportunities. And then finally, you need a software platform that can take those two assets and present them to different market opportunities and optimize them and also do two very important functions that a lot of people don't understand are needed here. Think of stationary storage, a massive industry in North America. Gigawatt hours of dispatchable capacity yeah. have been subsidized for years. Yeah, three gigawatt you get hours a, in one project right now. You get a stationary storage battery and you can discharge into the grid and do all sorts of things because it's your battery. Now you have a significant cost associated with buying that energy. So the CapEx is not zero, it's significant. But once you have that asset, you can go ahead and do whatever you want with it. A vehicle battery is interesting. It comes free with the leather seats and the air conditioning. Nice. It's paid for by the mobility duty cycle of that vehicle. But the two costs that have to be taken into account, are you going to make darn sure that you do not interfere 
with that mobility duty cycle. The person who needs that car to drive always needs to have access to it. You can give them information. You could say, well, if you want to drive right now, it'll cost you 200 bucks of opportunity. If you wait an hour, it won't cost you anything, but it's your decision. You can have that kind of conversation with the driver, but the driver needs to know that they can always drive their car and it will have enough energy in the battery to do their next trip, or they won't let you do V to X with their car. So that's one cost, if you will, of V to X that needs to be managed. And then the second one is the vehicle OEM, the company that made that car, is on the hook for eight years and 100,000 miles of warranty. So they designed their car and picked their electrochemistry and sized the battery based on what they thought would be the mobility use of that vehicle, knowing that it would be parked more than 90% of the time on average. Now, yeah, if you bring, more, yeah. mm. I mean, generally more than that. That was another now, thing too bring... I wanted to ask you about was the warranties too, because they have it a certain amount of years, a certain amount of miles, but I've kind of thought, you know, just the way that batteries work, it could be a lot different, like how many kilowatt hours you cycle up and down. And even with energy storage too, it's super important that you keep it within a certain range of charging. It might be a very complicated calculation to figure that out, but you might say if you keep it between 50 and 60% charge, say, then that's not bad for the battery at all. Whereas if you bring it all the way up to 100 and drop it down to zero, that'll kill the battery. And somehow they need to figure out how to incorporate that into their warranty, whether they're driving far or if they're just discharging to the grid. That's exactly kind of where I was going. So the OEMs have this warranty concern. They pick their electrochemistry based on expectations. And now all of a sudden, that vehicle battery is going to be used while the car is parked. How does that affect battery degradation? So the OEMs have great concern about it. So in order to do V to X, the third thing you need, other than the bidirectional vehicle and the bidirectional charger, is you need to have a software platform that's sophisticated enough to not only manage the charge and discharge relative to the different grid facing revenue opportunities, but you also have to manage around the mobility requirements that paid for the vehicle. And you have to manage around the OEM's battery warranty concerns. So you kind of have to be an expert on battery degradation and know what you can and can't do under what circumstances. So the third leg of the stool, if you will, of V to X, which is what my company does, is we provide that software platform heavily based on AI, data science. And so we're able to optimize across all of those variables, protecting mobility, protecting the battery, and then making the most money from different grid-facing market opportunities. And then we also need to not only optimize, but we do need to be able to communicate the information about how much was made so that everybody is comfortable that, that money's actually been earned and so forth. So you need that software platform, and that's what Formata Energy is focused on. That's our role, kind of the Android of vehicle to grid, if you will. Yeah, I imagine there's going to be an app or something like that, and you program your app, like how far down do you want your battery ever to get, worst case scenario? Are you going on a vacation and you don't care about driving somewhere tomorrow? Or do you want to be on standby in case there's an emergency or something like that? lots of different variables. And then you have the different battery technologies too. Whereas you say like lithium iron phosphate, you can bring it up closer to 100%. And then the other types of chemistries with cobalt in them, like my car, I don't usually bring it up. In fact, I never brought it up to 100%. Yeah, everybody knows they should leave their cell phones and their laptops not at 100% all the time, and yet they do it anyway. And that's not atypical. Almost all vehicle EV charging takes place at home at night. And almost everybody charges it up to 100%. I typically lock mine at 90. I set it that way, but most people don't. But when you participate with a vehicle to grid services provider, they'll manage that. And one of the things that's interesting about Vita X is, as you said earlier, we'll tend to want to have that car sit at between you know 50 and 70% state of charge when we're not using it for grid services. And so the battery health actually is better in a managed vehicle to grid environment than it is without it. And there's some scholarly peer-reviewed journal articles out of the UK that have looked specifically at V to X with the LEAF and have found that properly managed vehicle to grid can not only earn money, but it can extend battery life. But to do it, you have to really understand battery degradation 
And we actually have gotten a patent issued in the United States and it's pending globally Great. that says if you do V to X and you take into account battery cell module or pack temperature or ambient air temperature, you're going to step on our patent. And when we show that to vehicle OEMs, they realize that we actually understand this. The variables that impact battery life start with temperature and throughput. And then there's also just time, you know, battery sits and you don't do anything to it. It's going to lose some of its capacity over time. Yeah. Another thing too about batteries is how do you define 100% state of charge? I sometimes wonder, you know, my car, it's an eight year old Tesla, 85 kilowatt hours, and the warranty just expired this year. And so I'm wondering if they could go in there and their just their automatic programming might make 100% have a different definition because they're not on the hook for a battery and they'd have more of a tendency to want it to be a little bit safer last year than this year. And then I could go out there and spend $20,000 on a battery. I'm not saying that there's a conspiracy out there, but <laughs> there could be. I mean, no, the OEMs happen. are very much in alignment with your concern and you are correct. For example, my first Pure EV, I've actually been driving Pure EV since before the Tesla Roadster existed. So I'm wow. kind of an old school zealot. Is that a Leaf a two then? No, I have a 2000 model year Ford Ranger EV pickup truck. Oh, that was a compliance that. vehicle oh, yeah. in California. Mine was one of the few that had nickel metal hydride, a battery inside of it. It's a really interesting vehicle. And that battery, that? by the way, mine was put in service in December of 1999. And my nickel metal hydride pack lasted until COVID. I got 20 years out wow. of that, so which was pretty, and I'm, car? I still have the car. I'm trying to decide if I want to hold on to it in its original form, which it currently has, or do I want to add a lithium iron pack right. and get 200 miles range? I'm still making that decision, yeah, you but could for the moment. sell it to Jay Leno. <laughs> I think he probably would be, and he might even have one of these old red. There's not too many of them uh, still around, but I've kept good care of mine. But my vehicle, my Ford Ranger pickup, interestingly enough, when it drained down to zero state of charge, it was actually closer to 50%. They just set the parameters for what you could see as a user to protect the battery. And typically, I think any given OEM, I'm sure, calibrates what they present to their customer as from zero to 100% state of charge. And it is not truly zero and 100% state of charge. But that said, it varies by vehicle. It varies by individual electrochemistry. And so, again, that's an element that the software platform has to be able to recognize. When a given vehicle plugs in, our software needs to know which vehicle it is and therefore which battery it has and what you need to do to protect that specific electrochemistry. And that's all part of this vehicle to grid sort of software platform operation. Yeah, so my car, they call that an NCA battery, and that stands for lithium, nickel, cobalt, aluminum oxide. And that battery has, they call it 3.6 volts nominal. And then when it's fully charged, they say it's about 4.2 volts. And I never fully charge it. I only bring it up to 80%. But what does 100% mean? It's just the display of my car, and maybe 100% means 80%. Maybe 100% means 100%. Maybe it changes every time they do an update on my car. And just while I was speaking of NCA, the other real popular type of battery that's good for long range is the NMC. That's lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide. And what's getting a lot more popular because cobalt is so controversial because of child labor in the Congo is the LFP. And that's lithium, iron phosphate, and F is for iron. And it sounds a lot like the name of your company. <laughs> Actually, we had a family meeting, which my family has been always involved with my businesses. We always agree on what the intention is. And then I ended up needing to name it. And when we named the company, we sat down, we were prepared for an evening of fun and arguing. And they said, well, what are you trying to do here? And I said, well, we're trying to get across the idea that we're pausing for a moment and thinking about this whole climate problem, because the two intentions behind the company in the first place were to accelerate the deployment of EVs and to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy on the grid as the primary source of generation. And those two intentions intersect at this technology. On the vehicle side, you know, right now you've been reading the paper that the OEMs are saying, well, we're going to scale back our production of EVs because, you know, the inventories are building up and the market's not as robust as we had hoped it would be. Well, the truth is it's because the cars are a little bit more expensive and early adopters are out of the way. And now they've got to make a bona fide economic argument for the value of an EV. Well, they're not that much out of parity when you look at the total cost of ownership because fuel costs are lower with an EV and maintenance are lower. 
but you do pay more up front. But if they're bi-directional and the car can earn thousands of dollars a year, I assure you that they will fly off the shelf. So this technology does address yeah. that objective of scale deployment of EVs. On the utility side, on the renewable side, the single biggest obstacle to scale deployment of renewable energy on the grid is you need massive storage designed into the grid to be able to handle the intermittence and generation associated with wind and solar. And that's where there's been billions spent to deploy stationary storage for decades. But the truth is the amount of storage that's going to be in electric vehicles very quickly will rapidly dwarf the entire stationary storage industry, a data point. I'm in sure it roughly is right now. Well, in roughly 2019, there was somewhere around four gigawatt hours of total dispatchable capacity from stationary storage compared to the Nissan Leaf that at the time was the only bi-directionally enabled vehicle. And it was a great early EV car, but you know maybe they sold 15,000 units of the Leaf compared to 200,000 units per year of the Sentra. I mean, it was a great EV car, but still not a huge market penetration. But just that group of vehicles, in fact, the earlier vehicles had small batteries, 24 kilowatt hours, up to 62 now. But that group of vehicles through 2019 had over four gigawatt hours of aggregate dispatchable capacity. That is where the storage is going to come from mm -hmm. in this space. And so those were the two objectives of the company were to enable that expansion of the deployment of renewables and the expansion of EV adoption. So I sat around with the family and I said, look, that's the goal of the company. It's like, let's pause and think about this for a minute because it's a transitional moment here. What are we going to do? And then I said, and it would be kind of nice to have kind of a sexy name, you know, associated with the auto industry, because we're tied to the auto industry, something like Ferrari, you know, let's think about that. And my son, who's a musician, immediately said, why don't you call it Fermata Energy? And I said, what is Fermata? He said, it's a music notation that basically it's a little half circle with a dot under it. And it means a pause for an undetermined duration, subject to the discretion mm -hmm. of the composer or the musician. It's like, pause and think about it, uh -huh. is actually captured with that Fermata symbol. And it started with an F, like you said, which associates yeah. with the ferrous metals and batteries, but it also is like Ferrari. So that's, it, it when, took us five minutes and then we ate our popcorn and gave it up because we knew we had our name. <laughs> it was, I think, 2010 so that, we made the oh, decision. Wow. So the that, company was formed like, in 2010. Like about 13 years ago, which is a long time ago in this industry. So it almost kind of talk about a pause. So that's like a 13 hour pause. Because if I just had to guess, I would say in the next five years, this is going to take off like crazy. And so in some ways, you might have been too early. Like if you got too much money all at once back then, there wasn't as much of a market for it. And so you see some great ideas get ruined because they get in the market too early. But it looks like you're holding on there. <laughs> we're doing fine in terms of that. But I will observe that you are right in general. We were early. We knew that we needed a bidirectional vehicle, and there wasn't one until 2013. So we spent some time working on that. But then when the LEAF happened, we pivoted. We had that solved for now. Then we shifted to the chargers. And there was a bidirectional charger that was through UL back in 2015 timeframe. Princeton Power made it. We bought some of those. We developed some R&D around it. But then we realized that was not a scalable commercial product, and the company would probably not survive. And then they're bust. They are, in fact out of business. Yeah, because the, they were too early too. Kind of reminds me, you ever heard of Beacon Power? They made the flywheels. Seemed yeah. like a great idea that was before its time that went bankrupt, unfortunately. I think one of the challenges, I mean, in the case of flywheels, that I'm a little bit more of a skeptic. I think that's an ancillary, but not a core value proposition for this emerging new technology. But EVs, bidirectional EVs do make sense. We were a little early, but we used that time to develop an understanding of things like what are battery health issues? How is the grid designed? What are the market opportunities? So we didn't waste the time while we waited impatiently, if you will, for chargers. And at a certain point, we said, you know, we can't get anybody to make a bidirectional charger because they don't get the value proposition. So we acquired a spinoff from Virginia Tech, a company called PowerHub. We bought them. And we right. make them build the first charger. And we and actually- from that's where you're on faculty too, right? No, I'm at University of Virginia. Oh, I was you're... there for 20 some odd years, which down the road, we're friendly. I don't, want, I don't want to mix those up. You guys probably hate each other on the football field. No, I have a daughter that went to Virginia Tech. We have healthy discussions around Thanksgiving when the football uh -huh. teams play. But what we did is we made the first UL approved charger. And it turns out it's really hard. 
UL, I've been pleased yeah. to learn, is way tougher than similar safety protocols around the world. There are standards for safety for devices, but UL is particularly difficult. And so we did get through UL with the first charger, and now several others have come out. And within the next 12 months, there will be a whole bunch of bidirectional chargers coming to the U.S. market. So the vehicles are now all going to be bidirectional. It's not just the LEAF. The chargers are suddenly all going to be, or not all of them, but lots of them are going to be bidirectional. So now the time is ripe. And so this is going, to your point, take off in the next few years rapidly. What does it take to get UL listed? So I know like in Article 705 of the National Electrical Code, if you wanted to do an interconnection, you need to be listed to UL 1741. There's even a different one in California that's 1741 SA. What is it like 50,000, 100,000, $200,000 to go through getting it something UL listed? It costs it more than that, but the cost isn't the getting it listed. It's designing the technology to be able to pass it. UL 1741 is a national standard, and UL 1741 SA and now SB are also national standards that California has required for interconnections, and so have other parts of the country. One of the problems, though, with regulators imposing these tougher standards, it's not a higher safety standard, the SA and the SB. It has more to do with the ability to control those assets if the operator goes out of business. It's about the software interacting with the grid. The problem, though, is regulators impose requirements ahead of the technology being available. So in California, for example, right now, they've decided that all bidirectional chargers have to be 1741 SB. Guess what? There aren't any. And so we've got a charger that's 1741 and another one that's 1741 SA. The second one isn't ours. It's made by Siemens, an international company. And then there are a couple owned by Borg Warner that are also SA. And none of them can hook up into most of the grid project, grid opportunities in California, because the regulators have said, you got to be SB. And so until chargers catch up with the regulators, the regulators are actually suppressing the ability for the grid to have access to all this dispatchable capacity. It's really kind of foolish. We yeah. have a similar conundrum that's emerging with CCS versus Chatamo versus North American Charging Standard, where regulators are putting their thumb on the scale, picking technologies, forcing things, and unintentionally interfering with and undermining the development of the technology. Yeah, I was thinking as they were putting a transformer on my block. So where I live, I'm not too far from Silicon Valley. There's a lot of electric vehicles on the block, and so they had to upgrade the transformer. And so you've got all these loads and people just want to plug them in in the afternoon. And people like me, it doesn't matter what time of the day I'm charging, it's the same rate, which is kind of silly. But if I took the average house, which is 10,000 kilowatt hours per year, I can do the calculation and that ends up being five amps continuous. So even though I have a 200 amp service, I really could get away with taking in five amps if I just used a lot of energy storage, like as what my car has, and smoothed all of that out. And so I think it's going to be the utilities and the EV manufacturers that eventually are going to be the ones begging for what you're doing, whereas at first they seem to be against it and they're not going to be able to survive without it probably, I think, in the next five years. I think the utilities get it actually at this point, in particular in California. PG&E's had to deal with backup power needs with some degree of desperation in yeah, the last few years. And they away, are... I think we're throwing away over a billion dollars worth of electricity every year, just curtailing the PV plants. There's an enormous appetite for bidirectional EVs. It's a challenge though. First, you gotta have the vehicles and then you gotta have the chargers. And then you have to have the vehicle to grid service providers who understand how to manage around battery degradation and mobility. And then they need to be able to work with the utilities and the utility regulators to get the programs designed the right way. For example, there's a litany of pain points that utilities experience for which this technology can provide a solution today, but there aren't very many market mechanisms to enable access to those value streams to being extracted from an electric vehicle. So we have to not only find what can we do today in California and in most places in the U.S., there's two what we call killer apps. There are two easy opportunities. You can make a lot of money. One is doing 
behind the meter demand charge management. So you discharge into the building load behind the meter so you save on demand charges, which are a charge added to the electric bill for the highest load. You know, when the electrons are moving the fastest through the pipe, they ding you because for the utility to provide that, that amount of energy at that time, they need to have an investment in upstream infrastructure commensurate with that load. But yet, if the load is only for a short period of time, they are not going to capture it by just charging you per kilowatt hour, which is the volume of electrons. So they've developed things in the tariffs, in the rate program to kind of solve for that. And that creates an economic opportunity. And we've got vehicles in the deployed across the US right now, LEAFs with a 15 kW charger that are doing behind the meter demand charge management in places that don't even have really high demand charges. And they're making, you know, two, 300 bucks a month in electric bill savings. And that's a good chunk of the cost of the lease of a leaf. Yeah. So that's very disruptive energy. And then you can participate. The other killer app, if you will, is actually participating directly in utility demand response programs. And so we had a car, there was a press release oh, about a year ago that a fleet vehicle, leaf, operated by a municipal wastewater treatment plant, was deployed during the summer months when in Rhode Island, where National Grid, the utility, has a summer demand response program. And that vehicle responded to a signal from the utility that was processed through our software to be able to discharge a total of 27 events during that whole summer, a total of 57 hours, which is not a lot of use of that battery, by the way, over the course of the summer. And all of those events were after 4.30 in the afternoon. So this vehicle was parked and ready for the night. It was not interfering with mobility. And that car earned 4,300 bucks wow. over the summer just doing that one thing. And so there are different things that can be done with electric vehicles today that are very lucrative. You can make $10,000 and more in certain parts of California doing some of these activities. But then you get regulators involved and they start requiring the next generation of technology, for example, 1741 SB. And that's great as new chargers become available to fulfill that. But in the meantime, they've shut off the California markets to being able to do V to X. So that's why we're doing it in the Northeast and in the Midwest where we don't have those restrictions. They waived the SB requirement until there's enough charges to actually warrant making it a requirement. Great, great, great. So maybe what we could do is talk a little bit about the different types of adapters and things like that. And also, are you going to be discharging through a separate inverter charger on the wall? Or are there going to be onboard inverter chargers someday? Or what's your view on that? And maybe we could talk about, we have like the CCS, the Chatamo, and the Tesla type of charger, and maybe any other ones you can think of. It's a great question. I'll answer in a couple of ways. So first of all, when my truck was born in 1999, there was a battle going on between the two charging standards. The induction charger that GM was using with the EV1 and the Avcon charger, which is what was used with the Toyota RAV4 EV, with the Ford Ranger EV. I think it was also in the Chevy S10 EV, although I wouldn't swear to it. In the early days, there was a battle between two technologies. And then at some point, regulators showed a bias towards Avcon and everyone said, oh, game over. Everything's going to be Avcon from now on. And most people today have no idea what Avcon means. And it'll be true. What we have today, or we've had a year ago, let's say, was a battle between Chatamo and CCS. Now, Chatamo, remember, was designed by a utility and auto OEM. So it was designed to maintain safety of operations in the grid context, but also for the vehicle. It's a third-party certification standard, which means that any vehicle and any charger that are Chatamo have to be certified by an independent third party so they work because they're mm -hmm. all perfectly aligned with each other. Yeah, and it has a Chatamo adapter with these things. Can you just stick the adapter on or is that going to work the same? Early days, most of the charging infrastructure was Chatamo. So Tesla astutely mm -hmm. created an adapter so that their vehicles could charge wherever they needed to. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they did not until very recently have a CCS adapter. And there are reasons why that is. Yeah, and so but just the, for um, everybody too, interestingly, the CCS is the typical adapter that most cars besides Teslas have these days. Mm, we'll disagree on that. Okay, then. <laughs> so let me, let me push wrong? back on that. <laughs> okay. 
Uh-huh. So most cars globally, oh, by I'm far, the, US, yeah. the okay. largest standard is GBT in China. And there's a lot more oh. advanced electric vehicle industry in China. And GBT, I should note, is very much like Chatamo. And huh. then recently, China adopted what's called the Chao G standard. And that is the exact same standard as Chatamo 3.0. And all vehicles in China going forward will be Chao G. So hmm. a narrative in the US and in Europe that says everything's CCS. And I go, well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. So it's true, though, that the Japanese automakers had their sort of line in the sand. They had their Chatamo and it was out there. But then when VW, interestingly, as their punishment for Dieselgate, they ended up having to build out a big fast charging infrastructure to help accelerate the adoption of EVs, but they were given free hands. So they made the decision, let's go with CCS because that's what we want in our cars. Why CCS? Because it's self-certified. And car companies don't like to be beholden to an independent third-party certification agent. So they opted for their own standard, CCS, because then they could self-certify. So then all the Electrify America's deployments were heavily tilted towards CCS. What a surprise. And then that forced U.S. and European automakers that were starting to get into the EV game if they wanted their vehicles to access this newly deployed CCS charging infrastructure, they had to go CCS. So they all did. So for a period of time, it seemed like everything was going to be CCS. Game over. You know, that's it. But then along comes Tesla and they decide to free up their own proprietary standard and make it an open public standard, which is now the North American charging standard, which is basically the Tesla standard. And a whole bunch of OEMs who have found that CCS has its problems, they, in about two shakes of of a lamb's tail, switched to adapting the North American charging standard. So, well, you know, six months ago, everybody said, game's over, it's all CCS. Now everybody is starting to say, well, I guess CCS is dead and it's going to be North American charging standard. What do you mean North American charging standard? That's the official name of the standard that the Tesla connector Oh, the cable. Tesla. Because, Tesla is North yeah, American the, charging standard. Okay. Yeah. Tesla made their own, but they've been generous and opened it up and to so the they public changed domain. the name sort of to North American. Yeah. Okay. Effectively, that is what the market is okay. calling what was at one time a proprietary standard. But so Tesla mm-hmm. opened that up. Now all the major OEMs have followed suit and they're going that way. I don't know what's going to win out. I still mm-hmm. tell you that everybody decided it was going to be Avcon. Now everybody said it's going to be CCS. Now they're saying it's going to be North American Charging Center. I don't know. Yeah. And, and I don't know, care. Yeah, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem matter. to matter that much because you just stick on a little adapter. You know? I will say, to be fair, I'm not biased towards any of them. But we've had extreme success with Chatamo because mm-hmm. it does work. And it yeah. works because it's a third-party standard. So it's uniform. CCS, it turns out, while there is a published standard, Every OEM implements it a little differently than the other guys. And so now you got to make a charger. If it's going to work with all of them, you got to know each of those bespoke implementations. And there are some challenges. You may have seen a lot of press releases over the last few years about how people are going to be buying school buses, doing V to X, making thousands of dollars per year. You do not see a bunch of press releases saying, and we made thousands of dollars per year. It's because there have been real problems with getting CCS to work, particularly in a bidirectional environment, and that will be solved. We have actually spent a lot of time in the last year studying those issues, and we think we've got it solved, and we're now working with a couple of OEMs, and you will start to see some school bus projects where we are making thousands of dollars, but it's been harder with CCS, and North American Charging Standard has its own set of challenges and advantages, too, so I think the jury's still out, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. These are still early days. Seems like a lot compared to two years ago, but compared to 10 years out, this is just early days in the EV game. And we'll see where this goes. I mm-hmm. predict it'll be a different standard than exists today that's on every vehicle in five years. It's just, we don't know what it is yet. It might be Chatamo 3.0. It might be some new version of uh, CCS. I don't know, and I don't care. I just want it to work. Yeah. And for me, from my perspective, just, you know, being an EV driver, it's just like, I want to go and be able to plug in. And there's sometimes where you show up and it doesn't work and it's broken. It's got spider webs on it. 
And that's kind of a bigger problem than what kind of adapter that you use. That's a huge issue with the U.S. infrastructure and to some degree with the European. I was on a call yesterday with somebody who is the father of EVs in Japan, actually. We were talking about this exact issue. And he was saying that in the U.S., various reports, somewhere from 25 to 45 percent of the chargers work at any given time, which means that more than half don't. And from my experience out there, that's probably about right. In Japan, they had 99.3 percent uptime last year, which was slightly above the 99.2% uptime that they had the year before. How do they do it? It's because they insist on it. In the US, there isn't really any regulation. The federal government gives subsidies, but they don't hold the charge point operators accountable for reliability. Mm -hmm. And even worse, they force, at another point, they force, like when the federal government recently it's part of the infrastructure money was a big amount of subsidy going into the deployment of charging infrastructure, which is a good thing. But they went ahead and put their thumb on the scale. And instead of saying any charger that you know meets safety standards is eligible, they said, oh, it can only be CCS. So all the fast chargers have to be CCS or they're not eligible for these massive subsidies. Well, guess what? The North American charging standard is not CCS and Chatamo isn't CCS. So now the regulators have put their thumb on the scale and the target moved. Hey, everybody went from CCS to the North American charging stand. So what are we going to do about that? So a lesson about how regulators should let markets determine these things. Don't pick technologies. Don't be biased in favor of one over another. Another quick example of that, that's probably you've spent some time in your broadcasts looking at stationary storage and you understand and appreciate its value. Stationary storage in this country would not be what it is today without the massive subsidies the S-chip subsidies in California, because it really didn't pencil out without those. So those subsidies exist to provide this available dispatchable capacity into the California grid. Why wouldn't the stationary mobile storage asset get that same credit? Well, because the regulators have decided it. So if you've got a big battery in your car, you know, a power wall would be eligible. A Nissan Leaf has the equivalent of four and a half power walls under the hood but they don't get access to that subsidy. It's not a good deal for the rate payers in California, to say the least. And it's an example of the government putting its thumb on the wrong side of the scale. That is one of my pet peeves is I wish regulators would let the market sort this out. It's too early to be picking winners and losers. We're seeing it with the SB requirement for inverters. Okay. So like my car right now, it has both ways of charging. So I could hook up to the battery direct current. That's for the faster charger. They call it level three or I have a charger that is the opposite of an inverter. A charger goes from AC to DC, so an inverter just goes the other direction, and it's a smaller one, and then that one I could just plug my car in to AC and it can charge. And so the question, you know, I'm assuming that I know that we could do either, but what do you think is going to be the biggest way of the future? It's like most people when they're charging at home, and I would imagine that probably 90% of EV charging happens at home, maybe even more than that. At um, least, yeah. And so I think people are overly concerned about having to charge at some other charger somewhere because you're just charging at home. And so are we going to have to get an inverter and stick it on the wall at home? So that's a really interesting and important question. My opinion is different from some people in this industry mm -hmm. space. A lot of people, some of the OEMs believe, I think naively, that when they have enough dispatchable capacity available under the hoods of vehicles, that the utilities will just magically waive the interconnection requirement of a UL approved inverter at a location. But that's not going to happen. And I'll tell you why. The inverter needs to be at a location. You're going to need to do it at an EVSE point on the ground at an address because for the utility to evaluate whether or not they want to allow that interconnection, they're going to study the upstream infrastructure carrying capacity to determine if it oh, can sure, handle yeah. that element. And they yeah, can't have to do get that if the interconnection agreement and all that stuff and put your breaker in the right place. Exactly. But if you're a utility, you would go mad if they let the inverter move around and plug in any number of places where you may or may not have adequate up upstream infrastructure. So we call it the roving or roaming inverter problem. Uh -huh. It's just a uh -huh. real issue. And plus, why pay for the space it takes up to have the inverter on the vehicle? Why pay for the weight punishment of having to have that inverter on the vehicle? And why should the cost of that inverter have to be in the vehicle? It actually makes more sense 
to have the vehicle not have an inverter and just have it connect to an offboard stationary EVSE where the inverter is. So you can enable bidirectional functionality, you can get an interconnection agreement, and then the car can just sort of drive around and plug in wherever it needs to. So I predict that that's where this will go for the foreseeable future. There are some standard setting efforts to try and get it to the point where it might make sense to have an onboard inverter, but at least it'll be a few years and it still may ultimately make sense from a cost, space and weight perspective to have that be an offboard phenomenon. The jury's still out, but I'm not buying this notion of onboard the uh -huh. vehicle long term. Okay. And I've had my friend Bill Brooks, who's a lot of people know, suggest that you could take the inverter that spins the wheels. <laughs> I mean, some of these cars, 100 kilowatts and things like that, and make it so that inverter could potentially feed the grid. Would that be possible, do you think? Again, you still need to think about the interconnection process yeah, to be enabling uh -huh. the discharge of current into the grid or power into the grid. I think okay. what will likely make the most sense is where the energy comes from. It can be stored in different ways on the vehicle. There are lots of ways within the vehicle environment mm -hmm. to manage where energy flows from. But I'm just suggesting at the point of interconnection with the grid, it makes the most sense to have it be through an inverter that's sure. off board, you mm -hmm. know, it's DC and it's stationary. Great. Okay, great. We got down in the weeds a bit today, didn't we, yeah, Sean? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yep. So I was also going to ask you, since you're single-handedly overthrowing the oil industry, do you think they have a hit on you? Are you kind of worried about that? Do you have to keep looking over your shoulder? I guess maybe it'll stop some of those wars, though, you know, taking care of that oil industry. So we're a startup. Of course, we're always raising capital in a sense. Uh -huh. And we are in conversations with a couple of global oil companies yeah, because sure. yeah. there are oil companies that don't like the threatening technology. A good illustrative case was back in the day, my nickel metal hydride battery pack that was in my 40V was a Panasonic battery technology. And the Panasonic sold the patent to Chevron. Mm -hmm. And Chevron spent 15 years suing anybody who would make a nickel battle hydride battery pack, from what I understand. And that's an example of an oil and gas industry player trying to delay the inevitable. But many of the major oil companies now understand that their future in the oil and gas game is definitely limited. That the direction things are going and have to go is towards renewables. And so a lot of them are very genuinely and seriously developing pivots into the EV space, into the renewable space. And so, you know, we'll pick our partners judiciously, but I'm not threatened by the oil and gas industry. I actually think that they're an important source of capital to support some of these major transitions that need to happen. Great, great. Okay. So let's say before we leave, how about, do you want to make any last comments, tell people where to find you, where to find your company, where we can throw billions of dollars? So the company you? is Fermata Energy and our email address is fermataenergy.com. And we're based in Charlottesville, but we're international in footprint, and we're focused mostly on the U.S. market for now, but we have a toe in the water with a couple of projects going in the U.K. and elsewhere in Europe. But ultimately, we are global in our intent. People are interested in learning about the technology. I've done a number of podcasts like this. These are great opportunities for the public to gain access to understanding about this emergent technology space. Our website over time, we'll increasingly have content that helps enhance knowledge about this industry. I would just encourage people to assume that this is inevitable and watch the journey unfold. We're, I'm a little early with this technology, but now that there are bi-directional vehicles showing up by the dozens and there are bi-directional chargers, not yet in the market, but a couple of them are here and there's a bunch more coming, including residential bi-directional chargers in the next year. Some of those chargers, by the way, will have backup power capabilities, islanding and black start features. So you will be able to power your home from your vehicle when the power goes out. And if you've got two EVs, you could drive them in and out and circle them out to where there is power and come back in. So you could literally power your home for an extended outage. So a lot of the interesting developments with the technology on the horizon. But I would predict that within three years, V to X will be ubiquitous. I'll make one other parting observation just to sort of tickle the minds of the listeners. Great. So historically, think of vehicles as a one-use asset, mobility. So who owned that asset? Duh, it was the party that needed that mobility use. So everybody owned their own car. Now, when you put an electric vehicle together with a battery in it, it becomes a reservoir of uses with multiple customers wanting to access different value streams 
from that asset. Some of them want mobility. Some of them want backup power. The building owner might want to reduce their electric bill. The utility might want to do various things and the grid might want to do some more things. So I predict that within five years, the ownership model for vehicles will very rapidly change to be an as a service model where it's more like Zipcar or you know Enterprise where the vehicle's owned by a third party and you rent the mobility use that you want for that vehicle. And while you're not doing that, they're making money doing different grid services, but that's just my reading the crystal ball of the future. I could be off the mark. Great. Oh, a I'm lot sure of changes you're... coming. I'm sure you're right on the mark. So yeah, it was great and very educational talking to you. I hope to run into you somewhere. Do you go to any of the big conferences and the solar and storage industry or anything like that? Or I do from time to time, and I would look forward to spending some time with you, Sean. I think what you do with your broadcast is actually really high value because you have an educational orientation. And I've learned a lot from listening to some of your solar work, and I really appreciate what Thanks. you do. So please keep it up. And if you want to circle back to the V to X world at any time, mm -hmm. we'd be happy to share what the current state of things has come to be. Well, thank you so much, David Slutsky from Fermata Energy. And thanks for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. To find out more, go to SolarShawn, that's solar, S-E-A-N dot com. Get NABCEP certified, take one of my classes, and take my energy storage class. We'll talk about four-wheeled energy storage systems. Over and out. <laughs>